that dressing, but if it's not documented, you didn't do it, right? And if heaven forbid you ever get called to court for a lawsuit because of negligence and you didn't document it, you got no proof, okay? Absolutely essential that you document. When should you document in relation to doing something? Immediately. Immediately, right? When you guys go to clinical, you're going to see that a lot of your sites now actually have computers in the room at the bedside, so you can document right there at your patient's bedside. That's not the case in all places. Some places you will have computers elsewhere on your units, but if that's an option, take advantage of it. You're right there, you get it in. Can you also still write things on a paper to remind yourself? Sure. Okay. But remember, it's not official until it's documented. Okay. So like when you guys come for vital signs check off next week, yes, you can bring a piece of paper and a pen to write your vital signs down on when you do them. Because then when you're done and you're finished with us, we're going to send you back here and say, now go document your vital signs in your patient's chart. Okay? And that applies for every scale that we do. Okay? So the documentation that system that we're going to use is called EHR Tutor, and it is actually within ATI. Okay? My my stuff looks different than yours because I have an instructor view. This is how your guys' student view looks when you get into ATI. When you um, go to your My ATI, when you log in, the My ATI tab, when you go to the Apply tab, you guys are going to see one of these cards, that's what they call these, one of these cards that says EHR Tutor. Okay. For some reason on my views, EHR Tutor does not appear and I don't know why. Okay? But you're going to have one that says EHR Tutor. When you click on the module associated with it, it's going to pop up a box that says Begin, and then it's going to ask you to enter a course code. So I know you had to do a course code to get into your fundamentals, right? You have a separate course code to get into the EHR tutor. And I'm going to pull that up for you guys now. Okay? Once you get into your course, you're going to see that there's a bunch of different activities. 
There's going to be an activity for each one of the skills that we do a competency check off on. So, next week, when you guys log in here, you're going to go down and there's a vital signs competency that, and this is where you're going to do your documentation of your vital signs. Okay? What we have in here for now for you guys to practice with is this introduction to EHR. Okay? So you have a patient that you guys can practice with and you can practice with this patient throughout the semester. It's going to stay here as an activity, okay? So we're going to go into this person's chart. Her name is May Day. The best way to learn how to use an electronic health record is to just get in and start clicking on things and playing with it. You can't break this. It's a training product, okay? So get in and just start playing with it, okay? So you just click on the patient's name once you get in here. bar should have your patient's information, right? So it gives you your patient's name, their gender, their birth date, you've got your height and weight there from the admission, okay? So anytime you get into an electronic health record, you should verify at the top of the screen that you're in the right chart before you start documenting, right? That's always going to appear at the top, no matter what electronic health record you're in. Okay. Um, this also tells me who the doctor is who admitted this patient. It gives me any allergies she has. Code status. What is code status? If she wants to be resuscitated or not. If she wants to be resuscitated or not in an emergency, right? So once we scroll down, this first screen gives you a summary of the patient's condition. Okay. So, in the patient summary, you can't make any changes to this first page, but it tells you she's here for pneumonia, so we know what her primary concern is. It's going to give you the last site set of vital signs that were taken. It's going to give you any allergies that she had. And then it's going to get into the orders. So. I know on the first step of your vital signs competency, it says verify physician orders for vital signs, right? So this is where you would find that in this section, okay? So when you come next week, you just have to say, I verified that I have an order to take vital signs on my patient because you're not going to have the computer in the room with you, okay? But when you go back then to do your documentation, you should be able to find that order that's right in here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And every skill we do is going to have an order associated with it. Okay? So, this particular EHR, it encompasses all the orders together, not only activity and diet, it also puts like medications in here, which is a little bit different, but it gives you any order that your physician has put out there. And then this also gives you um, the most recent set of lab values. Okay. For us in this class, we will not do a lot with lab values. You guys are going to learn about these lab values in your MedSearch 1 class. We will refer to a few of them when we get to our medication competencies because there are certain lab values you would need to check before you administer a medication. We're not going to quiz you on what normal levels look like and 
why we check them and all of that in this class, okay? It's just, we will be focusing on the bare minimum, okay? But that's what the summary page looks like. So now let's say I want to go in and I want to document a new set of idle signs for Mrs. Gray, okay? Or, oh, this is May Day. I'm sorry, Mrs. Day. Your guys' screen looks a little bit different than mine when you pull yours up. What you'll see on this patient summary side is you already have a column over here with a bunch of different titles on it. Mine just doesn't pull up for some reason but it'll look like this. You guys are gonna have all of these different tabs. So patient summary, information, results provider, all of those things. The two categories we're gonna focus on the most in this class are the notes category and the flow sheet, okay? So if you go under this flow sheet category, this is where you document most of your nursing care, okay? So, there's your vital signs right at the top, okay? We start doing assessments, there's assessments. Intake and output, we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. So basically, the majority of your nursing care is gonna be documented somewhere under the flow sheets tab, okay? And that's very similar to what you're gonna see on your electronic health records once you get out into clinical, okay? So, let's say we wanna put in some vital signs for Mrs. Day. So, made sure that I'm still in the right patient's chart, right? Again, I have already here the last set of vital signs that was taken. It's going to populate here. When I want to add something new, I'm going to go up here to the top and hit new entry. Okay. So with this new entry, there are a couple things that you need to look at. This um, EHR and most of them, see how it already populates the date in the current time. So unless you are documenting something that you did four hours ago, if you're documenting in real time, you should just be able to use that and not have to adjust it, okay? It also has my initials up here to let me know that I'm documenting through my sign-in, okay? When you guys get into clinical and you guys are sharing computers between students, make sure that you're logged in under your own <coughs> sign-in. Because what happens if I document under your sign-in? It's, it's possible that I do, but I could be falsifying documentation, right? Because did you do that care? No, I did that care. So make sure you're under your own sign-in, okay? So now we just start adding our vital signs. So I had you guys keep your activity from Tuesday, was that Monday, when you guys started doing vital signs, right? Where we had you take them on a pier and do your height and weight. You can use that to practice to go put them in here, okay? But we're just gonna make up some vital signs today. So I'm gonna say, my patient's temperature was 36.5. Would that be Celsius or Fahrenheit? Celsius. Celsius, so make sure you check the correct measurement, okay? How did I get this? How are we taking them? Oral. My beats per minute, I'm gonna see 80. How are we taking a pulse? <coughs> blood pressure, oh, it's taking my guys. It asks you, what position is your patient laying down, supine in bed, are they standing, are they sitting? Sitting. You do not have to, to input the mean arterial pressure, we don't do that in this course. I'm gonna put my respiration rate, my oxygen saturation. The first concept of the ATI Helix for success is client sensitive. And then 
oxygen source. So remember, if your patient is not on oxygen and they're just breathing the air around them, that's what room air means, okay? If they are on oxygen and they have a nasal cannula in their nose or a face mask, then we would be selecting something different. But if your patient is just breathing the air around them, that's what room air means, okay? We're gonna talk more about all these other oxygen devices next week. Um, when you guys get further along, and some of the competencies, when we start talking more about pain, there's a place to record pain scales, and you guys talk in depth some about that in your fundamentals class, so I'm not going to get in depth with that today, okay? And then down here, we already have those height and weight measurements, but you guys recorded those on your sheet, so you have the opportunity to put those in as well from the other day, okay? Once I have everything in, then I'm just going to save it. It's going to take a minute. Yeah. So we just select the same patient that you did when we go in there to practice? Uh -huh. But yeah. we can just put what we got. You can put whatever you want. Yeah. You can go in and put whatever our friends you want. Yeah. Because it's an introduction, that introduction to EHR patient, you can change your information all semester if you want. That patient will be there all semester for you to play with. Yeah. So one of the features of this particular health record is that one, it provides vital sign graphs, which sometimes are nice to look at because you can get a quick view to see how things have changed over a period of time, right? So my last vital signs were taken at 1140. These ones were taken at 1245 and my temperature came down significantly, right? So it gives you this view, but it also lays it out here and you can see what we just documented. If you made a mistake, in entering something, you can go in and hit the edit button and edit it. I will tell you in most live documentation systems, if you edit it, it's going to ask you why. Mm -hmm. Right? So you can say documented an error or whatever. Okay. Questions about how you would enter vital signs? Yeah. When we take the temperature in Fahrenheit, would you want us to convert it to Celsius or just leave it in Fahrenheit for the test part of it? You can leave it, you just need to make sure that you select okay. either Fahrenheit or Celsius, okay, perfect. right? Mm -hmm. Just make sure you do the right measurement, because yeah, if you put 65 degrees, right, or whatever, where we put it in yeah. under Gene Bray and yes. Vitals. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, what, so yeah, you're going to do your assessment. Sorry. Come back. Document. Would you, we just talked about we're documenting in as real time as we possibly can, right? So the expectation is that you've documented that information before you leave the building. Okay. Because I wouldn't go home and document my vitals at 8 p.m. tonight, right? Right. So, if you guys don't document before you leave the building, and Dr. Davis is great about she grades as soon as you guys are done, if your document, documentation isn't done by the end of class, you're not going to get points for your documentation because it has to be done in real time. Does that make sense? And we remind you that when you get done, I always say, okay, now go document. Don't forget to document, right? Questions about entering vital signs. Okay, so then as we go on, we're going to get more into 
some documentation and what we have to write. But um, so there's different places to record things. Like I said, we talked about. Um, you guys already did daily care, right? So if that's where you document that you gave a bath and brush people's teeth and all those types of things, right? So most of your care is going to be under this flow sheet. There's your restraints. We just talked about restraints this week. That's why you would do restraint documentation, okay? Um, the other category that we're going to use a lot is notes, okay? Why do you think we would write a general nursing note? If the patient likes something specific. Okay, if there's something specific to the patient that we need to communicate, right? Mm -hmm. And who would we be communicating with? Mm -hmm. Each other, other nurses, or techs, so they can look at that. Okay, who else? The doctors. The doctors, right? Anybody who's working, you guys are going to be working with a lot of people who are working with your patient. It's just not your nursing team. You have your doctors, maybe you have a dietitian, maybe physical therapy is involved, right? Pharmacy, whatever. You're going to have a lot of people. So any <coughs> note you write, that person can go in and read it. And if they haven't, you know, taken care of this patient before, they can see what's going on with this patient. Okay? So in notes, you can go in and you can read any notes that somebody else has put in. This is how you would get yourself up to date. Like maybe say this happened, looks like these happened on day shift. Maybe you're a night shift nurse and you want to see what happened during the day. I can go in and read these notes, right? Or vice versa. And then I can add a new note. When you look at your notes, um, make sure that you choose the correct role, right? So I want to choose that I'm the nurse. That's who's <coughs> writing this note. What type of note? And we usually default to nursing note, just a general nursing note. And again, see it already populated my date and time that I'm creating this. Okay? So I could say I'm just going to make something that is, this is free text, okay? Patient complained of abdominal pain. Five out of ten on your scale. Abdomen is firm to touch. No outcomes noted in left lower quadrant. Patient stayed last EM was five days ago. MD, our provider, notified of patient condition. Will order KUD, which is an abdominal x ray. And then I would say, what am I going to do after that? So I'm going to say, if it was something specific that they gave an order for nursing to do, I would say that I'm going to do that. But now I'm going to say, will continue to monitor as needed. Ah, okay. Once I've included everything, I don't have to sign this because I'm already logged in. It's under my sign-in, right? So I don't need to sign my name again, okay? See how my sentences are very fragmented? It's not like writing a story. You're just giving them the information as fast as you can, okay? guys are going to see when we get into more advanced skills past the vital signs, like next week when we start talking about tracheostomy suctioning, we have sample documentation in included in your modules that gives you kind of an idea of what you should write. On the bottom of your competencies as well, it says exactly what you need to include in documentation. Okay? 
So now my note's in. The next nurse comes in, she can go back and read my note and say, oh, this patient had abdominal pain today. She forgot to tell me about that. I should go follow up on that, right? Remember, some people who are dealing with your patient might only see them for five minutes a day. So this is the way we communicate with them, especially if they work on a different shift than us. Okay? Questions about basics of writing a note? Okay. So get in and play with this introduction patient. Document whatever you want. Make up some story about her. I don't care. The only way you're going to learn to use this is by inputting information, okay? No, for vital signs next week, you just have to put in the vital signs. Okay. When we get into like trach sectioning, you're going to write a note like this to tell us what you did in that procedure. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, vital signs is pretty basic. All you got to do is put those values in. Yeah. So if I was the night nurse and that was a note from the day nurse, do I have to put a response like saw your note? No, it's just out there. It's just out there for you to review because what if you came in and you did your shift change report with the off-going nurse but she forgot to tell you that, right? Yeah. If I read back through then I can go, oh, she didn't tell me anything about the patient having abdominal pain, right? Yeah. So then that should trigger me to go, I should ask them if they're still having that pain. Okay. Yeah, you don't have to respond to it, but it's just you covering to say, hey, look it, there was a concern with my patient, this is what I did about it. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And I would have physicians come in in the morning and go, because I started a night shift nurse, so they would be like, oh, I read your note that this happened during the night. What happened? Did we follow up on that, right? Oh, okay. Other questions? Yeah. So, okay, this is from experience when I had one of my babies and it was, I had her on Easter. So it was a Sunday, random, um, kind of a random group of people working. So I gave them grace for that, but they were not talking to each other and documenting stuff and giving me at least my Tylenol. You know, that's all I needed. I wasn't looking for narcotics. But I tried to tell the nurse that came in or that it might have been, you know, an assistant, whatever. And she's like, well, she, she would not give me any Tylenol. I was like, fine, it's not that big of a deal. But they, I asked them two hours ago. Like, what do you do? Like, so you have to ask it for yourself, right? Yeah. And if that, I mean, if something isn't seen, yes, as a nurse, you should be looking back in the charts. You see, I've had that happen before where I forgot to give a medication, and that nurse who took over for me called me at home, right? I mean, you have to follow up on what happened. That's your responsibility in being a good caregiver, right? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that I just decided I didn't want to give that person something, but I totally had spaced it. So it's your job to follow up so really mm -hmm. and yes your patients patients have to advocate for themselves too right we have to teach that to patients right especially when we're doing education about new medications or before they go home right saying this these are things you need to look out for and follow up with us so yeah. But in the case, it sounded of, like there's poor documentation. In the there. case of the narcotic, though, there were. I mean, I know the rules are really tight, and there were, you know, we will be held very accountable for that. Right. Um, so what if it was a situation like that where I was in extreme pain from surgery or something then that's like that? A conversation you have to have with your physician. Mm -hmm. That is, there's something else you can do. Even though it's the middle of the night and you're. There's always somebody on call. On the <laughs> no, there's always somebody on call. So that nurse should have called the 
position and said, hey, this is the case. I mean, okay. even if that doctor is at home in bed, there's somebody who's on call that you report about. Yeah. Mine wasn't working either. I had to sign out. And sign uh, back did in. you have to sign out? I had to sign out in. completely and then sign back in and then go back in. And it may be because you guys have already signed in because you then probably have been in it already. So yeah, I my own class is doing So that yeah, that's always a good API sometimes has issues like every other technology, but that's your best bet is to sign out and back and then the other. Any other questions about documentation in here? So once you guys do your documentation in here, we we can go in and view it as instructors. Okay? You don't have to send us a screenshot. You don't have to do any of that. We go in and view your documentation. Okay? Yes. Uh, they told me that. You might have to sign all the way out of yours and sign back in too, because that happened to people this morning. Any other questions? You don't have to check out the <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk to you guys about the fall risk assessment. Do you know that you're supposed to do a fall risk daily on your patient along with your physical and technical assessment? Do you know that you have to do a fall risk? No. Okay. I thought just when they come. No, you do a fall risk every day. Okay. You do it when they come and it's a fall risk every day, okay? So we'll start off by asking, who do you think is at risk of fall? Say it again. Who's at, who do you just think is at risk of fall? Elderly. 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 Believe it or not, everybody's at risk of fall. We're all at risk of fall. We can go outside right now, we can fall down the stairs, we trip over our shoestrings. We're all at risk of fall. Some are just more than others, but we have to have a fall risk assessment on everyone. And do you know that when someone falls, that is not only do you have to do the report, that's a change in their condition too. Okay? So what the fall risk assessment does, it'll tell you like who's more at risk for fall than the next person. So um, the low score on from zero to 24, you're on the low side for fall. So we're all probably right now, we're probably on the low side for fall. Then you have a medium risk, 25 to 44, and then you have a high risk. So you start out with, have you had a fall within the last 90 days? So we're just gonna say, yes, I've had a fall within the last 90 days. 
So that'll add 25 points to their fall score, okay? Mm -hmm. So then, like you all was saying, pre-existing conditions, stroke, hypertension, vertigo, Parkinson's disease, seizures, stuff like that. So we're gonna say, yes, I have hypotension, okay? So do they need assistance with their ambulation? So how do you know if a person needs assistance with ambulation? Unsteady gait. Say it again. Unsteady gait. Unsteady gait. We're gonna check. We're gonna check their gait during their physical assessment. Okay. So we'll say they need some assistance. Um, so do they have equipment around them? That oxygen tubing. Usually when patients are on the floor, they have to have an IV site because we have to have emergency access just in case something happens. Right might not be hooked up to any fluids or anything, they just have to have their IV. But if they have, if they're hooked up to fluids or something like that, guess what? High risk for falls because guess what? That's a tripping hazard for that um, IV tube. So let's just say yes, they have that too. What is their elimination status? What do you think that means? Incontinent. Incontinent. So what do you think they're going to do? Run to the bathroom. Try to get up and go to the bathroom, okay. So what is their mental status? Once again, that's something else we're going to check um, with our head to toe assessment. What's the mental status? Are they confused? Are they alert and oriented? So we're going to say disoriented. And then their medication. So if a patient is taking like a diuretic or some type of laxative or something like that, they have to go to the bathroom. And they're going to probably get up and go. So guess what? Huge fall risk, huge fall risk. So this is what we determine, and then it's also a nursing judgment as well. So how do you think you use your nursing judgment to judge if a patient is a fall risk? And if you should use the bed alarm, what? Anybody? You notice a patient like trying to go to the restroom or something and they may be having like a limp or difficulty getting there. Mm -hmm. What if you're recovering a patient from surgery? What if they send a patient up to surgery and you're recovering that patient? Even though they haven't had a fall within the last 90 days, still a huge fall risk. What do we do when we work up from surgery? Where am I? What's going on? We're trying to find out what's going on. We're trying to find out who's around us. First thing we're going to do is try to get up, right? Right. So what can we do to prevent falls? Make sure the, the one put the bed on to make sure it's all done. Bed, rails, up, bed, rails up, bed alarm on, what we've been doing in the lab. And this is what we're trying to tell you. Who's in, who knows if they're in my 105 or not? Anybody in my 105 clinical? Good, okay, so I'll let you know right now, this is very near and dear to me. I take everything in nursing very seriously, but I am a stickler for infection prevention and fall risk. So, if you're in 105 and we're in clinical, if you leave a patient in an unsafe position, you'll be in Dr. Hart's office. I do not skimp on patient safety at all. If we can't keep a patient safe, we cannot be good nurses. That's our first priority is to keep a patient safe, okay? So, let's talk about it. I want you guys to be very, very vocal about falls and what you think. We shouldn't be the, we shouldn't be the only people that we're talking about. You guys gotta talk. You gotta, we don't know what to teach you if we don't know where you are. Say something. Let's, let's know. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I want you guys to tell me what you know about fall. Tell me what you know. Tell me what you want to know. Try to get a sitter. Try, you can try to get a sitter. Try to get a sitter. What else? Oh, I just had a, I guess, a question about okay. falls. Um, so if somebody just had a baby, mm -hmm. um, are they considered at a high fall risk? Mm -hmm. Okay. Definitely. And even when they're pregnant, they're definitely considered a high fall risk because their center of gravity is off. Okay. <laughs> we, we can always put the bed alarm on. You don't need an alarm. Uh, um, you don't need an order for a bed alarm. But the thing is, if a patient refuses, remember I keep telling you guys, patients have the right to refuse. If the patient refuses, then what are you going to do? What do you think you're going to do? 
patient is, mad, you know, you know, before you get in there mad and they're trying to jump up and, like, y'all work into so many wires and you're trying to keep them safe before they jump up and, you know, and that situation is just scary, you know, because mm -hmm. you do want to keep them safe, mm -hmm. want to make sure they don't fall, because fall can be deadly, you know, yes, I had a woman that was out covering me when I was a kid, she fell down the steps and died. Mm -hmm. Right, it just came straight through her nose, whatever it was, but I know how bad a fall can be. Yeah. Um, and I don't take it lightly either. Yeah. But it's like, it's kind of, it's kind of, not the ones a little scary because there are times when they jump up and, like you said, I've walked past rooms that weren't my patient, mm -hmm. and I would go in there and, but like I said, I've had people that tell me, well, that's not my patient. And it's funny because I say they are, I mean, they're everybody's patient, but it is a situation. Them cars, you know, it, it, I've seen it to where it was so bad to where then I have to try to, you know, but trying to get them to the back, and it's, it's a scary thing. Yeah. And I did make a note of that to tell the morning class too. The patients get jumbled up in the cords all the time. They yeah. do. If they have that uh, EKG monitor on, they have the blood pressure cuff on, they got an IV running, yeah. and they fall asleep mm -hmm. and get you twisting and turning, they're probably jumbled up in the cord. Mm -hmm. And then if we tuck those sheets underneath and they're in the bed underneath the blankets, guess what? Their feet are, co are covered. And guess what? They try to get out, can't get their feet out, probably going to fall. Mm -hmm. And some falls we can't prevent. Guess what? We have to have assisted falls sometimes. Some falls we can't prevent. If a patient is going down and you can't prevent it, you're going to have to assist them to the floor. And guess what? It is still a fall. And you still have to report it. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's what I was getting to. I was going to ask, say if you're an observer patient and you just don't have to be in the room and they're on a high fall risk, mm -hmm. they're on and they get out, like, yeah, I'm going to be on mm -hmm. I want to be in my cell. What do you do? Like, you're literally like, no, we don't have to. Okay, and uh, if they don't want you to do anything, you still have to be there with the patient. You still have to be a standby assist. And if they're, that's the way they're doing it. And if they get ready to go down and you can't prevent that fall, you have to assist them to the floor. Just because the patient tells you, I can do it, and you know they're getting ready to go down, you're not just going to walk out the room. You might have to assist them to the floor. Or you might have to try to get them back, do what you have to do to get them back in bed to prevent the fall. Because some falls we cannot prevent. And if you can be and assist, if you have to assist in a fall, you have to know how to do an assisted fall so the patient won't get hurt because it is our job to secure the patient's safety. What else about falls? What do you have to do if you have a fall? Yes, ma'am. Can you speak up, please? I was gonna say another good way to prevent falls is to adjust the better one settings. I know on my mm -hmm. unit, we always adjust it to the middle. It doesn't yeah. matter if they're, it, I mean, it's annoying when it goes off, but it really prevents them getting out of bed. So I have people like finagle their way out of bed with the line of the alarm on. Yep, that alarm, um, that alarm adjustment. Yep, that's the way. Yes, yes ma'am. If the patient falls, you should um, leave them like on the ground until you can assess them to make sure they're okay to like get back up again. Okay, okay. But what are you going to do? Are you going to you're going to do? Are you going to leave the patient? No. no. Okay. So what are you going to do? You're going to do your assessment right there. And what is something that you can do as a nurse to get help? Press the call button. button. Press the call button. Or yell out for help. Yell out for help. So what are you going to check for if your patient falls? Blood pressure. You going to do what? Vitals. Vital signs and what else? Check for injuries. Check for injuries. Check for injuries. Bleeding, what about bleeding? Yeah. Check the bleeding. You're going to get some help in there. So this scale kind of guides how you go when your patient is a high fall risk. It guides your nursing judgment. It guides what we're going to do for the patient if they're a high fall risk, okay? But me, I just deem everyone a fall risk because we can all fall. You just might be on the low end of falls, but you're in the hospital for a reason, right? So you can be on the low end, and I have to assess your gait before I let you get up and go somewhere, okay? So what else are we going to talk about with falls? What else you guys want to know or what else you guys want to put out there? I don't know if it's true. at the hospital if it's the same, but if it's an unwitnessed fall, then you have to put it on neuro checks, right? Okay. So you have to you check them every check. so often. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can do neuro checks. And that's something that we do in our head to toe assessment. The first thing in the morning we do a head to toe assessment is the neuro check. That's true as well. 
Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Do we have to notify their family about their form? Yes, you can notify the provider. Yes. Yep. Everybody has to be notified of the fall. Okay. Of the fall. So, yes, ma'am. If um, a visitor who's not a patient, if they fall in the hospital, do you have to document that too? That you don't document it in the patient chart, but it is an incident report that needs to be filled out. But okay. you don't have a chart to document that answer down, but it's, it's definitely an incident report. Okay. Okay. What about the people that are like chronic abusers, the patients that just keep getting out of bed, keep falling? So that would need to be the restraints because they're we were talking about that yesterday and they're saying it's kind of hard to get restraints ordered. It's like the you have to start off slow, so you start off with a sitter. You have to try to get it. What if you don't have the staff? If you don't have the staff, then you bump it up. Then it goes to restraints. So I recently had this situation. We have absolutely no staff. Patient is altered status is com mental status completely altered doesn't even answer to his name. This is the COVID unit where, of course, you got a PPE, and when you're in that room, you're in that, that COVID room for a while. So if something happens to this guy, he can't get in there. So they're restraints. But guess what? If you have on restraints, how are you still getting this nightgown off? How are you still getting your condom cap off? How are you still getting your brief off? So something is going on, and eventually, he's going to wiggle out of these restraints. So then, we went from sitters, we don't have a sitter. We went to physical restraints, we don't, um, that's not working for him. We might have to bump it up to chemical restraints. So he might have to be basically put out in order to be safe. But that's something you definitely, well you have to get a restraint order from a doctor and a sitter order from a doctor too. But you, you have to get the chemical restraint order from the doctor. So you might have to chemical restraint order. So it just has to start off really, really slow. But we're trying to get him bumped up to chemical restraint because either two things are gonna happen. Either he's going to fall and get hurt if he got out of those restraints, or he's going to be gone. He's going to open that door, get out of his restraints, open the door, and we're not going to know where he is. So that's the only way you can keep him safe. But you have to go step by step. You can't just, I'm just going to go for the big one. I'm going to give you some physical. No, <coughs> you can't do that. You have to start off with trying to get a sitter first. Yeah. Anybody else want to know something about falls? Yes, ma'am. Um, the pilot but do you have to have them wear a gay belt all the time? Yeah, you can you can use a gay belt. That's yeah, you can you can use a gay belt all the time. You, somebody's not a you can still anybody else know anything about falls? Anything you want to share? Have you if you're a tech or if you work in a hospital, have you sustained a fall? Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I guess patient education and family education is really important for mm -hmm. patients that have had um, strokes don't realize how unsteady they can be. And I've had one fall and I was right there. Mm -hmm. And I said, please don't get up. And he did get up. Yeah. And I know that happens too. <laughs> that happens too. Some stroke victims don't understand that you're not where you used to be mobility wise. So they just get up and just go down. Yes, ma'am. I think also all about home education for like patient calls. Say it again, honey. Like home education. Like yes, home education. education. That's very important too. That's very important. What about their medication? How are you educating them about their medication? Do you know which um, medications they have that puts them high risk or fall? You have to educate them on their medications too. What else do you have to educate them about? Because that's part of our nursing, that's part of the nursing process is our education. We have to educate patients. So what else are you going to educate your patients about? Yes. Can you educate them about like being able to assess their status if they're getting ready to fall, like if they're feeling dizzy mm -hmm. or if they're feeling, feeling uh, yep. weak? then maybe they should ask for help. Exactly, there you go, there you go. You guys know this, you guys know this. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Yes ma'am, I'm not gonna help you. Maybe just saying, hey, you know, before, if you've been laying down, can you sit down before you get up? Just try and sit there for a few minutes mm -hmm. just so you can get away from the, what is it, you know, is it the before you find them? Yes. To reduce the risk of falling. Okay, and what about report in and report out? Are you reporting to the nurse uh, that when you're coming on shift or going off shift, hey, this patient is a high risk to fall. Yeah. There are times to assist. They can be up at lib, 
or there are times to assist, or there are times one assist, or they're complete, completely bed rest. They're completely bed rest. You need to be reporting that. That's a safety thing. You need to report that that patient is a high fall. You need to put it in their chart. You need to look for it in the chart. You need to do one of these every single time you assess your patient. You need to assess for fall. <coughs> We had a um, patient last semester, luckily, was not my student, but 